Hello? Hello. This is Dr. Smith's office. Is this Wendy? Yes. Your pregnancy test is positive. Congratulations, dear. Call us back next week and we'll set up a time for you to see the doctor. Bye now. <gasps> yes! All right! I can't believe it! Wow! Oh. Wow. Feeling a bit overwhelmed? Uh-huh. You're about to find out the answers to a lot of your questions. On Pregnancy for Dummies. I think she kicked me. Gloria, you know right now the baby's having the hiccups. The giggles is a new one for me. That one I haven't heard. Right here. See this little round white circle? Yeah. That's the lens of her eye. Really? Wow. Here's your number one rescuer. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you that cutie pie? Oh, God. He's so cute. There's a lot of dreams and hopes, and and you think about what is this child going to be like. It's uh, it's just um, a lot of dreams in there, so it's, it's a very magical time. Dr. Joanne Stone and Dr. Keith Edelman are partners in this busy New York OBGYN practice. They're also the authors of the book, Pregnancy for Dummies. In this program, they'll lead you through what to expect during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, which is called the first trimester. What symptoms will you be experiencing? I'm very nauseous. What tests will you need? What things should you avoid? And what can you enjoy? And speaking of enjoyment, you know you're in good hands because the doctors who wrote this book love their work. In medical school, you rotate through internal medicine and surgery and pediatrics and things like that. And as soon as I got into OB, that's just what I loved. I would just stay up all night, I'd hang out with the midwives doing deliveries, and I just knew that that was what I wanted to do. The one thing I knew when I went to medical school that I absolutely didn't want to do was OBGYN. And that was one of my first clinical rotations as a third year medical student, and I was just completely smitten with it. It was so fascinating to me. Along with Dr. Stone and Dr. Edelman, you'll meet Wendy. Hi, Wendy. She may remind you of someone you know. Yourself, maybe? She's a woman who was in control of her life, confident, and rather opinionated. That is, before she got pregnant. Now her body is going through a mysterious process without consulting her. She buys pregnancy book after pregnancy book, and all that information is overwhelming. Then she finds Pregnancy for Dummies. Look, she's feeling better already. We wrote this book and made this television series so that we can provide women who are pregnant with good, accurate medical information, and also to put into perspective some of the information that they've heard from other sources. And by the way, we know you're not dumb but some of the information that you get about pregnancy can make you feel that way sometimes. We really, really think that pregnancy should not be scary. Pregnancy should really be fun. To help guide you through the show, you'll see icons, just like in the For Dummies books. They'll help clarify or highlight key information, like things in pregnancy that are particularly important to remember, or the countless things in pregnancy that you don't need to worry about. What's the first thing you should do when you find out you're pregnant? Well, after you shout for joy or cringe and panic, you'll need to find a doctor. In general, there are four different types of practitioners that deliver babies. The one that I think most women go to is a general OBGYN. That's a doctor that has a special training in obstetrics and gynecology. The next type would be a maternal fetal medicine doctor. That's someone who's done a, a training in a general obstetrics and gynecology, but they've also done training in high-risk pregnancies. And then another type of practitioner is a nurse midwife. It's a nurse that also has training in taking care of pregnant women and delivering babies. In general, I think women that go to a nurse midwife tend to be a little bit lower risk. And then the fourth type would be a family practitioner. These are doctors who take care of men, women, and children. They're trained to take care of families throughout their lives, which includes obstetrics. The important thing, though, is to be comfortable with the person that you've chosen, regardless of the type of practitioner they are, somebody that you feel comfortable going to with your problems and concerns. Oh, look at all the babies. We'll find your picture. Come on in here, Robin. Okay. Hi, Robin. 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 Hi,
Robin is coming to see Dr. Stone for her first appointment. As you can see, she's working on baby number two. But don't think just because she's been pregnant before, she knows all the answers. Each pregnancy is unique and comes with its own set of considerations. <laughs> first prenatal visit. I'm eight weeks pregnant and I'm feeling okay. <laughs> Quite nauseous, but feeling okay. So you've made it to your first appointment. What should you expect? Well, for starters, you'll have to weigh in. While it's normal for most women to gain weight in their first trimester, you might not be prepared for the initial shock. That is so not true. <laughs> That is not true. It's not possible. <laughs> They'll also take your blood pressure, a urine sample, and ouch, draw some blood. This will help your doctor find any signs of problems that could affect the health of you or your baby. After that, you'll receive a routine gynecological exam. Your doctor will also ask you a lot of questions at that first appointment. No, she's not prying. She's just trying to get the kind of information she needs to give you the best medical care. So when she asks you about your lifestyle, gynecological history, and family background, give her the whole story. No family history of any mental retardation, Down syndrome, anybody born with any congenital heart defects or anything, spina bifida? No. Not in your no. family. And your ethnic background? I always ask patients about their ethnic background, not because I'm being nosy, but because there's certain genetic diseases that are more common among different populations. So for example, Robin and her husband are both Jewish, so we would screen them for certain diseases like Tay-Sachs disease or Gachet's disease. If a patient is African American or Italian or Greek, there are other diseases that we would test for also. At that first appointment, you'll also get an answer to your most burning question, just how pregnant are you? A lot of what we do depends on how far along somebody is. There are certain tests that are done at specific time periods. So we have a little wheel and we put in the patient's first day of the last menstrual period and that gives us what we call the gestational age in weeks. And that puts your due date March 10th. I always discuss with patients the different prenatal tests that are available to make sure that the fetus is okay. And basically there are two different types of tests non-invasive tests, for example, blood tests or ultrasound, that can help screen for certain problems in a fetus. Those tests aren't 100% diagnostic, but they're good for screening for problems. Then there are invasive tests, like a CVS or amniocentesis, which will definitely detect chromosomal abnormalities in a fetus. However, with any invasive test, there's always a small risk of miscarriage associated with it. My feeling about it is that, you know, this is the information you guys can interpret this in the way that you want and then decide what you want to do. If you want to, if you say... Robin you know and Stephen chose a non-invasive so test, invasive which will be done in several weeks. One of the most wonderful parts of that first visit okay. is listening to the baby's heartbeat. To do that, the doctor uses something called an electronic Doppler device. Sometimes, as with Robin, it's hard to pick up the heartbeat so early in a pregnancy. In that case, your doctor will use ultrasound, which can capture the heartbeat as early as six weeks. We'll always document that there's a heartbeat there that's really important at every OB visit. We make sure that we can show the mother that everything is going fine. When a patient hears a heartbeat for the first time, they're often surprised by the sound of it. Um, it's very fast. It's normally between about 120 and 160, although it could go just a little bit higher. So people aren't used to that really quick heartbeat because that's twice what our normal heart rate is. All right, Robin, it looks great. So you're all set. Great. It's wonderful. It's, uh, it's, it's good because it's, it's proof, you know. When the first couple of weeks, there's no physical signs because she's not getting bigger. So it's good to come in and actually see something. It makes it more real. Makes it more exciting. I can't even talk. It's awesome. It's the best. Relief. <laughs> I often just hold my belly, or Stephen will snuggle at night and hold my belly, and just and I know what's going through our minds is this baby is growing because of us, and it's amazing. I I, I can't even describe it more than that because it's just. 
it's a miracle. A lot of people in the first visit will say, well, when can I tell my friends or what can I tell my family that I'm pregnant? And they have the, in their mind, at the end of the first trimester is really the best time to start to tell people. The fact is that they really can tell people after the heartbeat is detected. After a heartbeat is seen, a normal heart rate is seen, the risk of miscarriage drops down to about 3 to 5 percent. We're calling to uh, let you know that we are pregnant. Oh my gosh. Isn't that great? So we're excited. We're due in March. Oh, I'm so excited for you. Once you've started spreading the good news, don't be surprised if you begin to get some rather odd advice from family, friends, and even strangers. Isn't that great? Old wives' tales have been carefully handed down for generations. And believe me, there's a reason they're called old wives' tales. Listen to this. Presenting 10 old wives' tales in order of absurdity. Number 10, the spicy food fraud. Eating spicy food will bring on labor. Well, you can try it, but it won't work. Number nine, the fetal heart rate fallacy. If your baby's fetal heart rate is low, it's a boy. If it's high, you're carrying a girl. Not so. Number eight, the you can't be too careful yarn. If a pregnant woman lifts her hands above her head or steps over a rope, she'll choke the baby. Give me a break. Number seven, the steamy sex superstition. Making mad, passionate love will bring on labor. It's really not true. Sex is not going to um, cause you to go into labor. But we tell people, go ahead and have a good time anyway. It's worth trying. Number six, the old heartburn harangue. The oldest one in the book. If a pregnant woman experiences frequent heartburn, her baby will have a full head of hair. What? Number five, the sty in the eye lie. Anyone who denies a pregnant woman the food she craves will get a sty in their eye. Well, you don't want to get in the way of a pregnant woman and her cravings, but the sty is a lie. Number four, the ugly stick trick. If a pregnant woman sees something ugly or horrible, she'll have an ugly baby. That one's wrong on two, two counts. One is there's no scientific evidence, but number two is that there's no such thing as an ugly baby. Number three, the old Java jive. If a baby is born with light brown birthmarks, known as cafe au lait spots, the mother drank too much coffee or had unfulfilled cravings during her pregnancy. Again, it's a myth. Number two, the gender bender. Everyone knows this one. If you carry wide, it's a girl. If you carry forward, it's a boy. It's a common one, but it's not true. Not true. And now, for the number one old wives tale, the poor complexion connection. If your face breaks out, you're carrying a girl because a girl will steal all her mother's beauty. Now that's just me. The thing about it is that it's so chauvinistic. Why is it that a girl is going to steal her mother's beauty and a, and a boy isn't? I mean, anyway, it's not true. It's ridiculous. Take advice from your friends with a grain of salt. But when it comes to the advice from your doctor, you really should listen up. Anybody that um, is thinking about having a child or women who are maybe not actively trying but are not using birth control should be taking a vitamin with folic acid. It's been discovered over the last several years that folic acid is very important in the reduction of an abnormality called neural tube defects. A neural tube defect is an abnormality in the closure, basically, of the spine and the spinal cord. And this problem with the closure occurs very early in a pregnancy, around five to six weeks. And what's been found is that by supplementing with folic acid, you can reduce the incidence of these neural tube defects. Now that you know how crucial that first appointment with your doctor is, and just how ridiculous some people's advice might be, we can move on to other important aspects of the first trimester. Coming up next on Pregnancy for Dummies. My breasts are growing and my waistline is gone. From headaches to heartburn, all those weird and wonderful changes to your body. Hey, 
Wendy, how are you feeling? Well, my breasts feel like watermelons. I'm nauseous. I'm tired. I have headaches. I'm hungry all the time. I'm constipated. I'm bloated. And I have to go to the bathroom constantly. Boy, are you feeling pregnant. Very. Body changes. Ah, yes. That feeling that your body isn't quite your own anymore. You can expect a whole range of physical and emotional changes during the first trimester. Hey, remember Robin? We met her and her daughter Rachel at her first OB appointment. She was pretty nauseous then. And she's pretty nauseous now. The first time I was pregnant, I would be nauseous in the morning, and then I would go to work, and I would try to be the best I possibly could. And then I would drive home, and I would be able to lay on the couch in the dark with the TV on, a blanket over my eyes. And I was, fortunately enough, I could lay there all night long. This time around, being on my second pregnancy, it's much different. I wanted chocolate milk. I don't have time to be nauseous. I don't have time to worry about myself because Rachel's my priority. Caroline doesn't have that problem yet. This is her first pregnancy and she's carrying twins. Right now, she spends most of her time on the couch, which is a good thing because she won't get much rest once those two are born. I love this couch. It's been my best friend throughout this pregnancy because every day when I'm nauseous and I have a headache, this is where I sit. Me, the couch, and the TV, and I'm just the most comfortable on this couch. Every woman experiences pregnancy differently. Some have loads of physical and emotional symptoms, from dizziness to mood swings. A fortunate few breeze right through without any symptoms at all. For Veronica, who is pregnant with her third child, nausea is not an issue. Her expanding waistline is. My body's going through so many changes. My breasts are growing, and my waistline is gone. <sighs> the symptoms that I'm having are uh, nausea, lots of it. I've become so much more sensitive now that I'm pregnant. Sometimes I get dizzy spells. And it's just all, all day long. I find myself crying over silly things. I feel like I have the flu, but I know I don't. I'm constantly hungry and always craving something sweet. My chest has gotten much larger, so I'm very self-conscious of it. Of course, Stephen's very happy. My breasts ache like you wouldn't believe, something that's never happened to me before. I didn't even know I had breasts before. <laughs> it's like, in a way, like an alien has invaded my body. So cute. Yeah. Wow all these symptoms, but why? In the first trimester, your body's undergoing just so many changes. Uh, there are different hormones that are increasing. Um, your body's changing in, in weight. Your, your blood circulatory volume is changing. There's so many different changes that they cause different symptoms, and, and that's, why, that's why they occur in the first trimester, because the changes are most uh, marked in the first trimester compared to the other two. If you find that you don't have any symptoms, that's totally normal and consider yourself lucky. And if you find that you're plagued with every symptom in the book, that's normal too. By now, you might be wondering, is there no relief? When you're nauseous, the first thing to do is just try to eat some small, frequent meals. So get a little bit of food in every few hours. Stick to foods that you really feel like eating, crackers, toast, things like that. You can try ginger, that's been shown to be useful. And also, if it gets very severe, ask your doctor about prescription medications because they're safe and they really can help. If you have a headache, you can take Tylenol. It's completely safe to take during pregnancy. I would avoid aspirin because it can affect the body's ability to clot blood. Um, also, you can try a cold compress on your head. Sometimes that works as well. The key to constipation is preventing it. So lots of fluid, foods with bran, fruit, and you can take stool softeners um, also, that'll help. If you find that your breasts are really swollen and, and are tender, just buy some really good supportive bras that fit. You may find that you're going through a series of bras in different sizes throughout the pregnancy, but that's about the only thing you can do. Okay, 
Now that you know how to handle the symptoms, what do you do about your concerns? We're talking about your baby. Of course you're going to worry. Pregnancy is a mixture of a zillion emotions going on at one time. Well, I have no waste. I'm, at times I'm very excited, and at other times I'm very nervous. At times I get scared, is everything okay? You hear all these stories that, oh, you're not supposed to use hair dye and this and that, and, and it scares you. Looking at what you use and consume in a whole new way? Can any of this stuff harm my baby? What about hair dye? Is it okay? There's no data to show that the most products that are used now on the market are harmful at all. In the past, some of the products contained formaldehyde and, and even arsenic, and obviously those are products that we know are not good for us. Most products now don't contain those compounds. What about a perm? Perming your hair is perfectly fine during pregnancy. There was some uh, concern years ago about perming your hair, but there's been no studies at all to show that um, a hair perm causes any sort of defect in the fetus or is any problem at all. How about leg waxing? Definitely. It does not cause any problem for the fetus, and they should feel good and be happy and be hair free. How about a manicure? Having your nails done is completely fine. You just want to make sure that you do it in a place that's um, reputable, that, that sterilizes equipment appropriately. And you also want to make sure that the area is well ventilated so that you're not breathing chemicals for a prolonged period of time. Please tell me it's all right to have a massage. We usually tell patients for massages just to be careful that they're not really rubbing your belly that hard to, to cause contractions. But it's really perfectly fine to do. And in fact, some insurance companies will pay for pregnancy massages. And they have some tables with cutouts for the belly, which is great. So it's fine. Now this is a biggie. To travel or not to travel. The only thing about traveling really that's, that's risky is that it separates you from the person who has been rendering your prenatal care, who knows you best really from the standpoint of your pregnancy. Um, you certainly shouldn't travel late in pregnancy when there's a likelihood that you might go into labor and deliver. What about those metal detectors? Metal detectors don't use ionizing radiation, which is the kind of x-rays that you have when you have a, a chest x-ray. So those are completely um, safe for the baby and don't pose a harm to you either. Once you're in the air, just make sure that you drink a lot of water because you tend to become dehydrated in a plane. And also make sure that you get up and walk around every couple of hours to keep blood from pooling in your legs to try to prevent you from getting a blood clot. Are seat belts safe for your baby? It's a common misconception that seat belts are made for non-pregnant people and that a seat belt can actually harm a pregnant belly. That's not true. Um, the baby's surrounded by amniotic fluid. That amniotic fluid provides an excellent sort of shock absorber and cushion. You should wear the seat belt below your belly, in other words, below the, the pregnant uterus, not across the belly, and then the shoulder harness should be at the normal place. But you should not um, avoid wearing a seat belt while you're pregnant just because you're worried that it might hurt the baby. That's not the case at all. Any worries about what's okay to eat and drink? For the most part, pregnant women can eat just about anything, but there are certain foods that we tell them to look out for or to try to avoid. Very soft cheeses or unpasteurized cheeses, uh, the raw milk cheese, um, that has been associated with containing, in very rare cases, um, a bacteria called Listeria, which can be associated with miscarriage or preterm labor. There has been some concern over the level of methylmercury in certain fish. And those fish in particular are swordfish, tilefish, kingfish, and there's a question about tuna that's still very controversial. The story with sushi is it's really no more dangerous to eat sushi when you're pregnant than it is when you're not pregnant. However, with raw meat or with pate, um, that they can carry an increased risk of toxoplasmosis, which is something that can affect the fetus. You may have been told by some misinformed friends to give up your morning cup of coffee. Well, relax. They're wrong. We tell patients that up to two caffeinated beverages a day is fine. Beyond that is associated with an increased risk of miscarriage or um, the baby not growing well. But up to two is fine, so you don't have to absolutely stop all caffeine. Worried about prescription medication? Most prescription medications are perfectly safe to take during pregnancy. There are some, however, that can have a potential risk to the fetus. So you should definitely talk to your doctor and go over your medications because he or she may want to switch you to a medication that's more suitable for pregnancy. 
Most over-the-counter medications are perfectly fine to take, for example, Tylenol or cough syrup, but you might want to check with your doctor first. Are hot tubs safe? Hot tubs are fine during pregnancy. You just want to limit your exposure to less than 10 minutes. Um, the key is that you don't, want, you don't want your body temperature to get above 102, and it's very unlikely that if you stay there less than 10 minutes that it's really going to get up to 102. Now, don't let that stop you from soaking your body in a nice, soothing bath. Just go easy on the hot water. While you can relax about most of the things you do and most foods you eat, there are some areas where you really do need to proceed with caution. A lot of people ask about drinking during pregnancy. We usually tell our patients that having an occasional glass of wine, maybe one time a week, is probably fine. There's definitely um, studies that show that uh, chronic use of alcohol can be associated with something called fetal alcohol syndrome, and usually that's more than two drinks a day. There's definitely no absolute lower limit of what's safe, but sort of common sense will tell us that an occasional drink is probably fine. A lot of people come on their first OB visit and they say, well, before I knew I was pregnant, I had, you know, five margaritas when I was, you know, on vacation. And that one episode will probably not cause any problem. Do we really need to ask this one? I mean, unless you've been living on Mars, you have got to know that smoking is not good for you or your baby. We know that smoking throughout the entire pregnancy decreases the birth weight of the baby by about a half of a pound. The two most harmful components of cigarette smoke are carbon monoxide and nicotine. Carbon monoxide decreases the amount of oxygen that gets to the baby, um, and nicotine reduces the actual blood flow to the, the, the uterine arteries, which ultimately go to the baby. If there was ever a time to kick the habit, this is it. If you can quit smoking during pregnancy, especially early during the first trimester, then the, the effects of smoking on fetal growth are really minimized or maybe not even be an issue at all. So there is an advantage to stopping while you're pregnant. So far, in the all-important first trimester, we've seen how to relieve your most uncomfortable symptoms, and you've got a good idea of what to enjoy and what to avoid. When Pregnancy for Dummies returns, we're going to help you get through something that might feel well, a little intimidating. Prenatal testing. I don't think I'm really nervous about the procedure. I'm more nervous about the results. But don't worry. Pregnancy for Dummies is here to help. Hey, Wendy. What happened? You're looking pretty blue. Still nauseous? No, it's not that. It's prenatal testing. It makes me worry about all the things that could go wrong. True enough, but you could think about it another way. Yeah? Prenatal testing can help you and your baby. Odds are you're both doing just fine. I hope so. Carolina spent most of her first trimester on the couch, coping with some pretty severe symptoms. But after years of infertility treatments, she's finally pregnant with you guessed it, twins. Yeah, Jackson Court. Madison, I've always liked Madison for a girl. Yeah, but I don't like Madison but, for a boy. But it's so common, too, for a girl. That's why I like Jordan. After all that, she and her husband Herb figure they can handle just about anything, including prenatal testing. So they've decided to have a prenatal test early in pregnancy called a CVS. I don't think I'm really nervous about the procedure. I'm more nervous about the results. So, um... I've been nervous since I got up this morning. CVS, which stands for Chorionic Villus Sampling, is a prenatal test that allows us to analyze the structure and the number of chromosomes in a fetus to make sure that there's no abnormality present. CVS can be done one of two ways. Either it's done vaginally or it's done through the mom's abdomen. In Carolyn's case, we ended up testing both fetuses through the abdomen. When you're doing the CVS, you're passing this needle through the skin, through the muscle of the uterus, and right into the placenta. You zoom up. You're going to feel a little cramp now, OK? On the screen, it looks maybe like there's a big area of placenta, but in actuality, it's fairly thin. So you have to be very, very careful that you're not putting the needle into the amniotic sac. And you watch with the ultrasound, and you follow the tip of the needle, which looks white on the ultrasound screen. And you're going carefully till you get right in the center of the placenta. Then you move the needle back and forth to sort of suction out that tissue. Now 
How you doing? In a CVS, we're taking a sample of tissue from the placenta, not from the fetus, and analyzing it in the lab. You might wonder, how can the chromosomes in the placenta be the same as the ones in the fetus? Well, in fact, they are, because when the egg and sperm come together and start increasing, the cells start increasing in number, some cells become the placenta and some become the fetus, but they have the same chromosomes. So you can test the placenta, and that reflects the chromosomes of the fetus. There's a lot of tissue in there. There's another huge chunk there. There's a ton in there. Okay, I can do it. It's gorgeous. It was worse for me. It was worse for you. I think it's worse when you have to watch. It is. That wasn't so bad, but it's not over yet. Because Caroline is carrying twins, Dr. Stone has to do the procedure twice. One down, one down. OK. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. OK. You don't worry about me. If I fall on the floor, you just keep on going. OK. <laughs> there really isn't any need to worry. Your doctor will be there every step of the way to guide you through the procedure. All right, instructions for today, just take it easy. It's normal to feel a little crampy, almost like menstrual type cramps. That should subside over the next hour. Mm -hmm. um, you can take some Tylenol if you want to, OK? And um, some people have a little bit of spotting. A little bit is OK. More than that, I want you to call me. Right. OK, any high fever in the next 24 hours, call me. OK. But I think you should be fine. Ah. Now I'm relieved. <laughs> I'm relieved now. Ready to go home? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Okay. Now that that's over, Caroline and Herb can relax, right? Well, not exactly. They have to wait five to ten days for the test results. Why so long? Because the sample has to be grown in the lab and incubated at just the right temperature before it can be analyzed under the microscope. All this takes time. While Caroline waits for her results, Robin, who is 11 weeks pregnant, has come for her prenatal test. She's brought her mother along for support. Today, it's difficult. It's in the back of my mind. I'm nervous because it's a test to see if there's something wrong with the child instead of something being happy that there's five fingers or that the heart beats there. So it's a little nerve wracking. Prenatal testing can be a bit nerve wracking. But more often than not, the results end up being quite reassuring. Your genetics counselor will explain everything. Today on the sonogram, as you saw in the um, brochure, what they're going to do is look at a side profile of the fetus. And what they do Robin doesn't have to go through prenatal testing in the first trimester. She has volunteered to participate in a research project at Mount Sinai called the FASTER trial. The purpose of this trial is to find a better, non-invasive way to predict Down syndrome early in pregnancy. What Down syndrome is, is one specific type of mental retardation that's caused by an abnormal number of chromosomes in the baby's cells. It isn't something people have control over. And in 95% of cases, there is no family history. It's just an isolated um, occurrence. Age, however, can be a factor. The older you are, the higher the risk. Robin, how old will you be at delivery? 33. 33. OK, so let's just get an idea here of, of where you're starting on this chart. So at 33, the risk uh, for any chromosome abnormality live born is about 1 in 280. And we usually estimate Down's cases make up about half of that, and that's about 1 in 600. As part of this study, Robin will have a special ultrasound to measure the thickness of an area in her baby's neck known as a nuchal translucency. It's been noted that fetuses with Down syndrome have a nuchal translucency that is thicker or wider than fetuses that don't have Down syndrome. You see this subtle little membrane back here? Mm -hmm. That's the nuchal translucency. This little thing right here that I'm measuring right from here to here is the nuchal, that, that space in between is the translucency oh, there. Okay. See how subtle that is? Mm -hmm. There's a, a large group in Great Britain that's done an extensive amount of work on the nuchal translucency. And what they claim is that by measuring the nuchal translucency in the first trimester that they can detect as many as 80 to 90 percent of all fetuses that have Down syndrome in the first trimester, which is phenomenal. Robin will have to wait until her second trimester when she takes a standard blood test 
called a triple screen to find out the status of her baby. Now that we've gotten through prenatal testing, we'll move on to the changes your baby is undergoing in the womb. And the greatest mystery of all, is it a boy or a girl? Let's find out when Pregnancy for Dummies returns. While it's impossible to miss the changes going on with your body during pregnancy, it takes some special equipment to see what's happening with your babies. Pregnancy for Dummies will now take you inside the womb. Veronica, who is now 10 weeks pregnant with her third child, is having an ultrasound. So at about 10 weeks, you can start to make out some of the structures. You can see the head over here and the brain tissue, which is really important. You can start to see the spine developing. Now, you might be able to see a very large spinal defect or neural tube defect, but small ones you probably wouldn't be able to pick up just yet. The first time you see an ultrasound, it might look like nothing more than a big blur. But as your doctor points everything out, gradually the picture starts to become clear. You can see the umbilical cord inserting into the placenta. The black over here is fluid. Actually, whenever you see black on the ultrasound, that's usually fluid. It's usually some sort of fluid. Now, sometimes it can be blood. You know, within the umbilical cord, you can see that it's black. That's blood. And over here, this is fluid. This is the amniotic fluid. Did you see it jump? Oh, yes. Look at that. It's moving. A lot of people don't realize that the fetuses can move. A little jumping bean. See, this is sort of stretching over there and moving its... So all these are normal, normal movements that a fetus of this gestational age can do. So it looks great. It looks perfect. You can tell a lot about your baby through the use of ultrasound, including whether you're having a boy or a girl. But during your pregnancy, you may hear a lot of other, uh, shall we say, less than scientific methods that are supposed to predict your baby's sex. So don't be surprised when someone approaches you with the Great Drano Hoax. This one is my favorite. First, you pour a tablespoon of Drano into the toilet. Then you have a pregnant woman urinate into it. If the water turns pink, she's carrying, you guessed it, a girl. If it turns blue, the baby is a boy. It's actually one that we hear about a lot. Um, about the only thing this will do will unclog your drain. The wild woman myth. If the woman initiated the sex that led to conception, the baby is a girl. Or if the woman was on top when the baby was conceived, it's a boy. Who makes this stuff up? Last but not least, the old spoon and fork fallacy. First, you place a spoon under one cushion of a sofa and a fork under another. Then you invite a pregnant woman to sit down. If she sits over the spoon, she's carrying a girl. If she sits over the fork, the baby is a boy. Okay. Sitting on a spoon or a fork? I don't think so. Um, you can see... Now that we've learned how your baby grows in the first trimester and how not to predict your baby's sex, Next on Pregnancy for Dummies, we find out, along with Carolyn and Herb, the results of their prenatal test. What if wrong, something's wrong with one and not the other? And, oh, God, my head just hasn't stopped since I got You'll up this fine. morning. You'll be fine. Coming up next on Pregnancy for Dummies. The first trimester is mostly a time of joy but for a small percentage of couples, it can also bring some problems. It's always best to err on the side of safety when it comes to pregnancy. So if you notice anything unusual, don't hesitate to call the doctor. If you're so nauseous that you can't keep anything down, either solids or liquids, and if that goes on for a couple of days, then you can get really dehydrated, so you should call your doctor if that happens. 
Bleeding is a lot more common than you would imagine. Up to one-third of women will actually have some bleeding in the first trimester of pregnancy. And most of the time it's not a problem. Most of the time the pregnancy continues and no, nothing happens. Um, but if you are experiencing bleeding more than just a little bit of spotting or bleeding associated with cramping, it is a reason to call your doctor. Possible symptoms of a bladder infection are painful urination, a burning when you urinate, um, if you urinate more frequently than you, than you um, normally do. Um, if you develop a fever, um, it's something, it's one of the first things your doctor will look at is whether or not you have a bladder infection. Um, and bladder infections are important to treat during pregnancy, so you should call your doctor right away if you think that you might have one. Repeat the HCG. One of the hardest parts of the, being an obstetrician for me, I think, is when things don't go well. So telling somebody who um, has been looking forward to this pregnancy that the pregnancy is not going to be viable or won't continue or has had a miscarriage or is in the process of miscarrying is always a really hard thing to say. 70% of all women who have had you know, one miscarriage go on to have a completely normal, healthy pregnancy in their subsequent pregnancy. So we try to be encouraging to those patients and, and, and also we, we try to point out that really there's very, very little that, that a woman can do to cause a miscarriage. Often women try to blame themselves. Maybe it was something I ate or didn't eat or maybe it was you know, something I exercised too hard or whatever. Really those things are not, not significantly associated with miscarriage. So we try to reassure patients that it's not their fault. It's something that that they can't pre prevent. If you've experienced two or three miscarriages, it's definitely something to go talk to your doctor about because there are tests that can be done and treatment given to try to prevent a miscarriage from occurring again in the future. How are you feeling? Better. Starting to show. A bit. <laughs> Through with testing? For now. How'd everything go? So far, so good. How many weeks pregnant are you? 11 weeks, 3 days, 2 hours, and 17 minutes. And speaking of counting the days, Herb and Caroline are finally getting the results of the prenatal test that was done over a week ago. They're kind of anxious, because after years of dealing with infertility, they are at last expecting not just one, but twins. That's twice as much to worry about. Hello. Hi, Joanne, how are you? Good. Yes, everybody is here. Oh, she can't hear it because she doesn't like picking up the phone when she gets news. So I'm the interpreter. Yes. Okay, thank God. Great. Oh, absolutely, we want to know sexes. Ha! I was right. <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye. She said they're both perfectly normal. You swear? I swear, I swear. And she goes, do you want to know the sexes? And I said, of course I do. And she goes, you have a boy and a girl. <laughs> yes. Now Caroline and Herb can breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> but they still have another hurdle to overcome. What to name those babies? Well, at least now they know the sexes. Their task should be a little easier. Hi, no problems. A boy and a girl. Our journey through the first trimester of pregnancy has come to an end. And aside from a few unpleasant side effects, it's been relatively smooth sailing. Pregnancy for Dummies got us through that first doctor visit we heard the baby's heartbeat, and we navigated our way through prenatal testing to a happy conclusion. But hey, this is just the beginning. We've got 26 more amazing and exciting weeks to cover as Pregnancy for Dummies takes you from here to maternity. Oh, oh yeah, and Wendy will be there too, along with her growing belly. You look cheerful. I've got some great news. It's a boy! Wow!
How's it going, Wendy? I love being pregnant. I just wish I could stop crying. <laughs> Welcome to Pregnancy for Dummies and the wonderful second trimester. In this hour, you'll get a clear idea of what's in store for you during the next 13 weeks of pregnancy. Oh, man. Oh, from your baby's first mm. movements. Wow. Could it be? To a round of prenatal testing, to a whole new set of symptoms, like mood swings. Um, like, this like euphoric, happy, like you just look like a happy bell and you're like, nah, nah, nah. But don't worry. We're here to help you deal with those highs and lows and anything else that comes up. To guide you through your baby's first moves and your many moods are the authors of Pregnancy for Dummies, Drs. Joanne Stone and Keith Edelman. Oh, that's great. We wrote this book and made this television series so that we can provide women who are pregnant with good, accurate medical information and also to put into perspective some of the information that they've heard from other sources. And by the way, we know you're not dumb, but some of the information that you get about pregnancy can make you feel that way sometimes. We really, really think that pregnancy should not be scary. Pregnancy should really be fun. To help guide you through the show, you'll see icons just like in the For Dummies books. They'll help clarify or highlight key information, like things in pregnancy that are particularly important to remember, or the countless things in pregnancy that you don't need to worry about. This is Renee. She's four months pregnant with her first baby. Renee is sharing the experience with the two most important people in her life. First, her mom, who's having a lot of fun shopping for maternity clothes. Is it a short? Look at this. Oh, those are great. <laughs> <laughs> Just what I need, something to make me more uncomfortable. <laughs> and her husband, Sean, who's often on the wrong end of Renee's mood swings. I do apologize to Sean when I, when I get snippy because I know I'm doing it, but then it's like you have no control over it. You just, <laughs> you know you're doing it, but you still do it even though you know it's not nice. Is this, this is a standard crib size? You know, I don't know. Jeff and Judy are also expecting their first child, a baby girl. And so vulnerable, um, you know, start, you start wondering like, oh my God, what mistakes did my parents make that I'm never going to do? <laughs> and then, you know, uh, then you hear yourself saying things that sound exactly like what your parents said to you. Stephanie and Mike are expecting their second child, and since they've been through it all before, they're a bit more laid back about the whole process. My philosophy is if you could have a baby, your own natural child, any other way other than having to carry it for nine months, I would do it. <laughs> it's a long time. But at least I'm not an elephant. That's 18 months, you know. It's a myth that all women love being pregnant. Some like it and some don't. So don't feel guilty if you're, you're one of the ones who don't. When we first met Robin, she was eight weeks pregnant. And she was experiencing a lot of the discomfort associated with the first trimester. Seven weeks later, she's happy to report that the second trimester is going a lot better than the first. I'm feeling great now. <laughs> uh, I have no more morning sickness. I have all the energy in the world, and I'm sleeping great, so I'm back to normal. The great thing about the second trimester is that all those terrible symptoms you had in the first trimester usually go away. Robin is here for her 15-week checkup. At this appointment, she'll have two blood tests, the AFP and the triple screen. These tests will help determine if her baby is at risk for a chromosomal problem such as Down syndrome or a neural tube defect such as spina bifida. I'm a little nervous, but it's to be expected when you have a test coming up to make sure that the baby's okay. So there's a little bit of jitters, but uh, you know, you always hope and pray for the best. It's understandable to be anxious about these tests, but as your doctor will no doubt point out, the problems they are designed to detect are relatively rare. 
remember it's only a screening test. So if the test does come back positive, don't freak out. It doesn't mean that you have a baby that has an abnormality. It means that the screen is positive. 5% of all women will have a positive screen. The incidence of neural tube defects is about one in a thousand in the United States. Um, because neural tube defects have to do with a combination of environment and genetics, the incidence can vary in different countries. Taking folic acid before you get pregnant, at least a month, one to three months before you get pregnant, can reduce the risk of a neural tube defect by about one third. You should also keep taking folic acid throughout your pregnancy. So if you're not already taking it, do yourself a favor and pick some up at your local pharmacy. It's an easy way to protect your baby. Robin and her husband Steve will be getting the results of their test back today. They're just a tiny bit on edge as they wait for the call from the lab, which they're expecting at any moment. I've been fine, you know, until of course the moment when you're waiting <laughs> and all of a sudden you get a little nervous. Hands are a little clammy, just waiting. It's one of a few hurdles we have left to overcome. So, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit nervous, but uh, I feel in my heart everything's going to be OK. Hello? Hi, Robin. This is Yara calling from Mount Sinai. I'm one of the genetic counselors. I was just calling you about your screening results. Oh, good. I just wanted to let you know that both screens came back fine. Great. Well, thank you so much for calling. You're absolutely welcome. OK, great. If you have any questions, just let me know. All right, thank you. Good luck with everything. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. We're in the clear. <laughs> Let's face it, waiting for test results is never fun. But it is a necessary part of pregnancy. In the second trimester, all women have some form of prenatal testing. If, like Robin, you're under 35, your doctor will most likely recommend non-invasive tests, such as blood screens or ultrasound. So see, here's the baby's head. But if you're over 35, your doctor will probably suggest a more invasive test called amniocentesis. With an invasive test like an amniocentesis, there's a small risk of a miscarriage associated with the test. Um, at age 35 or over, the risk that the baby can have a problem, a chromosomal problem, is the same or greater than that risk of miscarriage. And that's why amniocentesis is recommended to women who are 35 or above. Tracy, who is over 35, decided to have an amniocentesis for both her pregnancies. The first time around was a little nerve-wracking, but she found a way to handle it. What I decided to do was put my face, put a pillow over my face, just so I wouldn't be concerned or alarmed at looking at the needle on the screen or anything. This time, Tracy is a lot calmer because she knows that an amniocentesis is really not as scary as it looks. How are you? Good, how are you? And your doctor is there to walk you through the entire process, step by step. An amniocentesis is a test that can be done during pregnancy where you actually withdraw some fluid from the amniotic sac, the fluid around the baby, and you can send it for a variety of tests. The most common test we send it for is to check the chromosomes or the baby's genes, the DNA. These days we do amniocentesis using the ultrasound to guide us so we can actually see what we're doing inside. And the way we do it is Watching with the ultrasound, we put a very skinny needle in through the abdomen into the amniotic fluid. Right now, we're just looking to identify a pocket where the baby isn't. Just in case you're wondering, and I know you are, your doctor will make sure the needle doesn't touch your fetus. You feel my finger. Okay, you can feel the needle. And we hook up a syringe and withdraw fluid. So in a second, I'll take out and then take the needle out. One of the best parts of the test? It doesn't take long. You're done. When it's over, your doctor will tell you what to expect. Today, you might feel some cramping or a little soreness. That's very normal, OK? Um, if you feel some cramps, almost like menstrual type cramps, you can have a glass of wine if you want to. That'll help the uterus um, so that it doesn't contract. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, if you need a Tylenol, you can take Tylenol. Take it easy in terms of not too much activity. You don't have to be in bed resting, but just take it easy at home. And by tomorrow, you can go about normal activity. The sample of Tracy's amniotic fluid is sent to a lab for analysis. Technicians, like Bryn Levy at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, can actually examine the baby's chromosomes to make sure they are normal. And here's the best part about the analysis. You can find out, without a doubt, if you're having a boy or a girl. You look cheerful. I've got some great news. It's a boy! Wow. <laughs> Now that you know what to expect from prenatal testing, it's time to move on to all the other things you'll begin to notice as you and your baby continue to grow and show. That includes a whole new set of symptoms. What can I tell you? I'm forgetful, so I can't tell you about it because I don't remember. <laughs> Let's just say your second trimester promises to be a real gas. Stay tuned to Pregnancy for Dummies to find out what we mean. Now that you're in your second trimester, you and everyone around you will begin to notice that you're pregnant. Most women start showing around 12 weeks, and a lot of them love their expanding bellies, like Renee, who is pregnant with her first child. I'm always holding my belly. I'm kind of proud of it. It's, it's sort of a rite of passage. It's kind of neat. But not everyone is as happy as Renee. Take Stephanie. Freaking cow. <laughs> Stephanie and Mike are expecting their second child. So Mike has some experience with how to handle the situation. So Listen up, all you expectant dads. Stephanie knows when she's getting bigger, if she's not going to fit into her clothes or things of that nature. She knows, but it's, it's my job to tell her that she looks fantastic at, at, at any time, which I try to do all the time. Bravo, Mike. But your job's not over yet. That expanding waistline will be bringing you a lot more than image problems to deal with. People are constantly complaining that they're more forgetful or they're just tripping over things. What can I tell you? I'm forgetful. So I can't tell you about it because I don't remember. <laughs> I honestly don't know why it happens, but it happens all the time. And along with forgetfulness comes what I call the klutz factor. What gets picked up will get dropped down. The physiological basis for it, I have absolutely no idea. That wasn't me. Unfortunately, it sort of goes along with pregnancy. There's not a lot you can do about it. You can get a dog, and you can always blame it on the dog. Or you can always blame it on your husband. But unfortunately, there's not much you can do. When you're pregnant, you may find that your hair grows even stronger or faster than usual. Some women, like Wendy, unfortunately may find that they start to grow hair in all sorts of weird places, like their stomach or parts of their face. Your belly. You get it on your belly a lot. Like underneath your belly button in that area, a big old patch of hair. It's quite attractive. <laughs> Waxing is fine. Shaving, plucking, tweezing, any of those things are perfectly safe to do. And people should be happy that most of the time that hair growth goes away and certainly doesn't continue after the baby's born. It's really intense. I, I can't, I, I don't know what's, I can't, you know, I'm usually very descriptive, but I don't even know what to compare it to. It burns. Normally the stomach sits in the middle part of the abdomen, but as the uterus grows, it pushes the stomach up underneath the diaphragm, and any contents of the stomach get pushed through that esophageal, esophageal sphincter, and it can cause, again, heartburn. First thing is to eat small, frequent meals. Carry antacids with you wherever you go. That'll really help. Carry around crackers, because that will help to neutralize the gas. And the last thing is don't even look at spicy food. Forget about it. It kind of feels like when you run and you get that cramp in your side. It's like that, but it's lower down. It's not fun. <laughs> it's not that much fun at all, because you kind of have to sit there and work it out and work it out. The ligaments are attached to the top of the uterus, and the other end of the attachment is right around the pubic bone. And as the uterus grows, these ligaments have to stretch to accommodate the growing uterus. And as they get stretched really thinly, um, they, can, they can cause a knife-like pain. 
it usually goes away by about 24 weeks, but sometimes it can be quite painful. A lot of people notice that their nose is really stuffed up, what we call nasal congestion, and that happens because there's so much more blood flow to the nose and the membranes within the nose, and so it tends to get fluid filled and you get stuffy. I walk up a flight of stairs, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's coming through my nose. A lot of people find that they are having nosebleeds, and another symptom is people snore more. Their husbands will complain that they're snoring so much because their nose is so congested. I was a quiet sleeper before. Yeah. Not anymore. I snore. Yeah. One of the things you can do is use either saline nose drops that'll help to dry it out a little bit. That's nose drops that have salt in it, and also. An occasional use of, of nasal sprays is fine. You shouldn't use it all the time, just as if you're not pregnant, but using, using them occasionally is fine. And if all else fails, your husband can always plug his ears or sleep in another room. And if snoring wasn't bad enough, that extra blood flow can cause another uh, unsightly problem. Just like you have more blood flow to the nose, you also have more blood flow to the mouth and the gums. So a lot of people find that when they brush their teeth, their gums start to bleed. That's very normal. You don't have to rush out to the dentist for that. One of the things that you can do that may help is just make sure you use a softer toothbrush. There are a lot of skin changes that you may go through during your second trimester that, while they're not particularly attractive, they're completely normal. You may notice a dark line developing on your lower abdomen called the linea nigra. Some women notice that their skin around their nose and cheeks becomes darker in a mask-like distribution, and that's very common too. You may notice some little red spots appearing all over your body. They're called spider angiomas. And some women find the palms of their hands become really red. That's called palmar erythema. You may notice that you grow little skin tags all over your body. Nobody really knows why it happens, but it does. Don't worry, because most of these skin changes will go away completely after you deliver. You say your belly's so big you're losing sight of your feet? You're keeping your husband up all night with your snoring? You know what? It's all worth it. We're in the clear. <laughs> As you're about to discover when we take you inside the womb for baby's latest picks and kicks. Oh, looks like a Harvard baby to me. Yes, of course. Never mind the head. Let's find the penis. <laughs> Stay tuned for a highlight in the second trimester, coming up next on Pregnancy for Dummies. Most couples these days will have an ultrasound at some point during their pregnancy. Ultrasound images give your doctor a clear picture of the baby's development. But to the untrained eye, they can look like an old black and white TV picture with really bad reception. With the help of your doctor, you'll soon be reading them like a pro. What can you expect to see? The leg. Okay, now even I can tell what this is. Now? You don't see it? Look closer. See it now? Cool, huh? Wow, that's the heart. And is it pounding? This is what the doctors call the classic four-chamber view. Get ready for the face. A lot of people think it looks kind of ghastly, like E.T. That's because the ultrasound beams pass through the fetus, showing a section inside the baby, instead of bouncing off the surface like a regular photograph. But if you're lucky, you'll get a good look at your baby's profile. Check out that nose. And just look at those itty bitty toes, all five of them. That's a relief. And the fingers, let's count. One, two, three, four, five. So far, so good. Because your baby is constantly swallowing amniotic fluid, which is perfectly normal, don't be surprised when the stomach shows up as a dark bubble. I'm sure you've heard by now that an ultrasound can reveal a baby's manhood. Yep, that's a penis, all right. We have a great view right here, looking up from underneath his legs. But contrary to popular belief, ultrasounds do not discriminate. You can also tell if it's a girl. No, not by the absence of a penis, 
but by the presence of the labia. While getting that first glimpse of your fetus is incredibly fun and reassuring for you, for your doctor, the ultrasound is an extremely helpful diagnostic tool. Ultrasound over the past 20 years has revolutionized the way that we practice obstetrics. Before, the only way we had to gain access inside the uterine cavity was really just to listen. Now we can actually see, and we can see the fetus. We can watch it developing. So we can detect many things that we couldn't detect before, and we can prevent a lot of problems that we couldn't prevent before. If you didn't have an ultrasound in the first trimester of your pregnancy, you'll most likely have one at your 20-week checkup. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Say hi. Dr. Stone. Stephanie and Mike are expecting their second child. They're seeing Dr. Stone for their 20-week visit. Stephanie takes advantage of this opportunity to talk to her doctor about all her concerns. So should you. Um, <laughs> what new symptoms? What new? No, everything, everything's good. You know, my legs hurt, but that's normal. Like, you know, I, I want to, like, hang from a bar because I want to, like, stretch them. Um, from the cramp thing, you mean? Yeah, you know, and if I go to stretch, you know, because, you know, you're not supposed to stretch, like, your midsection, right? Like, you know, in the morning when you usually go, Ugh. I try not to, like, stretch here. I just try to, like, pull my legs yeah. down. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Everybody always said that's bad. See, I listen to my friends. No, it's one of those myths that we have. You know, if you stretch in a funny way that, you know, your baby's going to end up looking like weird. Like, you can pull his no. arm out or yeah. something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it's not a problem. Um, I feel the baby move all the time, like, a lot lately. Um, but I always feel like that, like, that, like what I, what I told you last time, that first initial like little kick, and it's always like right here. Mm -hmm. Is that like normal? I'm like, why is it always in the same spot? Well, at this gestational age, you know, the baby is pretty low down. It's not like it's up to here. Because it feels like he's it's kicking like on the, you know, the baby's kicking on the top of my uterus or yeah. something? Yeah, they tend to kick right by the cervix. Oh, okay, so that's normal. Okay. But don't worry, you know, if you don't feel the movement so consistently now, right. it's still, still a little bit early to be totally consistent. Right, so. that's what I figured. And just, you know, I'm starting to feel that like uncomfortable in my own body stage where I'm like, Careful. you know, my Careful. breasts are like under my armpits and I'm like, you know, it's like I have to gently lower them when I take the bra off. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's not as easy to get out of bed and, you know, bending down for things. And so this morning I was shaving and I noticed that I can't like shave certain areas because I can't see them anymore. Right, right. So after you've asked all your questions, you'll be taken to an ultrasound room where your doctor or a trained technician will perform a 20-week ultrasound. It takes about an hour. And don't worry, the ultrasound waves are not harmful to your baby. A 20-week ultrasound is an ultrasound where we look at different structures in the fetus. We measure the head, we measure the arm bone, the thigh bone. I'm looking to, to see that the fetus is growing appropriately. So this is the head I'm going to measure. Looks like a Harvard baby to me. Yeah, of course. Never mind the head, let's find the penis. <laughs> All he wants to see. So this measures both the, what we call the BPD, the biparietal diameter, and then the head circumference. Okay. What's the BPD? That's the distance from one side of the head to the other. Okay. We're looking for any abnormalities in the development of the spine. You know, you've heard of neural tube defects. We're looking for that. This is the lower spine. And this is, if there were a neural tube defect, one of the more common places to see it. We're looking for any defects in the heart. You know, normally the heart has four chambers and certain blood vessels that come out of the heart. We're looking at that structure. You can see the four chambers of the heart. Okay, the right and left ventricle, the right and left atria. Heart defects are one of the more common congenital defects in a, in a newborn. And the four chamber view of the heart will pick up the majority defects. And this is absolutely perfect. In the stomach, we're seeing, does the stomach have a normal appearance? Is it full, meaning that the connection between the mouth and the stomach is OK? This is a stomach, and this is important. It's a normal-sized stomach. So this means that the baby's able to swallow the amniotic fluid, which is normal. And the connection between the mouth and the stomach is intact. In the kidneys, we're looking for any fluid accumulation or any cysts in the kidneys. And the kidneys look completely normal. We look to make sure there's no signs of obstruction, backup of urine in the kidneys. Over here, you can see the umbilical cord inserting. This is where the future belly button is. So 
Um, and that looks normal because we look for certain abnormalities of the abdominal wall too. There can be defects in the abdominal wall and this looks perfect. We're looking at the thigh bone, the lower legs, the toes, are, th are there any club feet? In the face, we're looking at the eyes, make sure that the eyes look okay, that there's no cleft lip. So you can see the lens of the eye, uh -huh. see that, yeah. see that? Yeah. This is the nose. I love this that is the, lens the, this is the upper lip. So the reason we look at that is you can detect a cleft lip. And that looks normal. And that looks normal. And look at fingers, so you don't have to wait till you're in the delivery room to count fingers. See the hand there? Look yeah, at that. See that? Well. It's moving. Let's try to see. One, two, three, four, five. This is the other one. Five fingers there. See the five fingers there. All right, great. Thank you. I love those words. Perfect. Yeah. Wonderful. Gorgeous. Oh. Hmm. Wow. Could it be? Sure could. The baby's moving. Feeling your baby move for the first time, what can I say? It's magic. When you feel that baby move, that's the greatest thing in the world. Although kind of weird, sort of like alien-ish, you know, like there's an alien inside your body. It's like, what's going on in there? Yeah, it's just like this, a little fluttering, or paddling, swishing, a <laughs> wishing feeling inside. <laughs> and it's like, what is that? I was driving in my car, and all of a sudden it was like this pow. You know, and it's right right when you're reading all your books and they're telling you that, you know, you'll start to feel the baby move and you're not sure if it's a baby moving or gas. You're like, I don't know what, what this, you know, I'm never going to feel this baby move. And it was like this this sudden kick and it was just, you know, oh my God, that, that was definitely the baby. Most of the time women feel movement at about 20 to 22 weeks. Um, if you're not feeling movement before 22, 23 weeks, you should let your doctor know. But sometimes you may just feel it irregularly, once in a while, that's normal. It's not till after 23, 24 weeks that it's really very regular. Kicking, paddling, fluttering, whooshing, and... Laura, you know right now the baby's having the hiccups. Are you feeling it? Yes, it's true. Your baby can hiccup. Almost like a little gas bubble, I would say, would probably be the best. The diaphragm of the, uh, the fetus can just contract on its own and it can cause um, a hiccup. And women perceive those hiccups um, as movements inside the uterus that are rhythmic. They occur very regularly and rhythmic. Not everybody feels them, and if you don't feel them, it doesn't mean that your baby's not going to have a diaphragm, but it just means that, that your baby um, is very subtle at it and you just don't feel it. We've counted fingers and toes, looked at baby's nose, and it's all all right. Next up, we're going shopping. Minutes, lay it list. Undershirts, onesies, gowns, stretchies, things that you need for the baby. From bibs to booties, your baby's going to need a lot of stuff. And the second trimester isn't too soon to start outfitting your layette. You're well along in your second trimester. Your belly's growing bigger every day. And it won't be long before your baby's here. But do you have everything you need? You might think you have plenty of time before the blessed event. But trust me, it's never too soon to start shopping. I mean, there are cute boy things in blue, but they're not like the girl things. I mean, like, look at that bib. Pregnancy for Dummies will now show you everything you need for baby, but we're afraid to ask along with a few things you don't really need, but will want anyway. Oh, Raggedy Andy! Hey, look, there's Raggedy Andy, one of them. No, they're both Raggedy and they're in dresses, oh. sweetie. Raggedy Andy wears pants. But hey, different strokes for different folks, right? First-time parents Jeff and Judy are entering a brave new world, the Layette Department. But they shouldn't feel intimidated. Someone with a lot of experience is there to help them absorb all this new information. You would lay it list. Undershirts, onesies, gowns, stretchies, things that you need for the baby. I'm very opinionated when it comes to this because I don't feel that you should put in these 
crazy colors because basically when you put a child into a crib, it's for one purpose and one purpose only, to go to sleep. Not to stimulate them, to lull them, to relax them. Bathtub, sponge, scissors, nail clippers, which by the way, the clippers are the best thing on earth. Bottles, did you have a preference on what you wanted to use? I haven't even thought about it. Thermometer, aspirator, ear syringe, pacifiers. It's a pumping style. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it'll pump for you. It's electric. It does both breasts at, at once. There's a comforter, a bumper, a dust ruffle. A dust ruffle may not be necessary, but really what it does to enhance the look of a crib, I say go for it. What about diaper genie? A diaper genie? Woo! Who knew you needed all this stuff? But you probably won't have to actually buy all of it. Plenty of friends and family will be eager to give you the hand-me-downs. Not that you'll always know what to do with them. Is this, what is this? Is That's this just a carry? No, no, it's for the bath. It's a little, it's, like, it's just for you, the bath. Because the baby's too small to put in a real bathtub, so you just put them by See, the See, I didn't even know what this was. This <laughs> is the first time picking this it's up. It's a sled. Yeah. <laughs> you strap them in at six months and send them down the snow. You know, and you're likely to be on everybody's expectant parent mailing is. list. Oh, incredible. We get all these free offers and magazines, and it seems like they just pour in, like as soon as you're pregnant, suddenly they start pouring in, you're somehow on a list, and they all want you for lifelong customers. <laughs> then of course there's the baby shower, where people give you more stuff, and it's all new. Thanks, Mom. Once you have everything you need, you can move on to the next step, setting up your baby's room. When it finally comes together, You'll see that it was worth all the effort. It's cute. Oh my god, be a mom. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever have those moments where you were like, I'm gonna be a mom? <laughs> my daughter is gonna be a mom. Renee is gonna be a That's mom. That's freaking her out. Yeah. Yeah, because I still think of you really as my baby. I know. You probably always will be, but now you're gonna be a mommy. Yeah. And you're gonna be a great mommy. Hope so. No, you are. Our tour of the second trimester is drawing to a close. We've seen baby's first pictures and felt its first movements. We've also gotten through some uncomfortable symptoms, had a few tests, and navigated the layout department. What lies ahead? Thanks. Thank you very much. As you enter the third trimester, you'll start seeing your doctor more frequently, about every two weeks. <laughs> Renee has come to see Dr. Edelman for her 28-week visit. You might have to go to 150. Let's take a look at her expanding belly, along with her expanding tattoo, as Dr. Edelman checks her fundal height. And we come to the top of the uterus. It should equal to the number of centimeters you are in weeks. 28 weeks. Yeah. 29, 28 yeah. weeks. So you're between 28 and 29. Perfect. Good. Good. So that's normal. The size is normal. Dr. Edelman also checks Renee's amniotic fluid. Yeah. The other thing we like to do is just to check the fluid and make sure the fluid around the baby, and you can sort of feel feel the baby sort of bouncing around in the fluid. Yeah, I so always that feels push normal. On the baby. That feels normal. <laughs> Next, he listens to the baby's heartbeat. Probably right around here. So Let's he's go head here. Down. I think right here. Okay. I think right here. All right. All right. All right. See if I'm right. You're probably right. I've done this before. <laughs> 150, which is normal. Should be anywhere between 120 and 160, so that's normal. This is Renee's first baby, and like most first-time moms, she's finding pregnancy can be full of surprises. So she's taking advantage of this time with her doctor to ask questions. Yes, I, uh, I just recently started to lactate and I thought that it seemed sort of odd that I, it was happening so early. Is that normal? No, it's, it's completely normal. It's, it's completely normal. See, what happens is, is that the hormones um, that support the pregnancy mm -hmm. are also helping your breast to develop ducts and, and glands to produce milk once the baby's born. So during the formation of those ducts and glands, it's not uncommon at all to have some, some uh, um, fluid to come through the nipples and actually you know, some, some breast milk come through the nipples. But it's like, you know, it could happen at any moment. Yes, like, unfortunately. Oh, it's one of those things of nature that are really interesting that, that um, you can't control. That's really for sure. Control, yeah. <laughs> There's many things in pregnancy that you can't control. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Renee's mom, who's been with her every step of the way, has accompanied her today. 
she came in where I work yesterday, and I am so excited when I see her. And it's all I do is after she leaves, doesn't she look beautiful? Doesn't she look great? Every pregnant woman she encounters, she's like, my daughter's having a baby. What do you do? <laughs> like, mom, you're like stalking people. <laughs> but I love it. I think she looks beautiful. I really do. I At think this visit, your doctor will explain an important and complex subject called the RH factor. Here's the scoop. If your baby's red blood cells have a substance called RH factor and your blood cells do not, your body may produce antibodies that attack your baby's red blood cells. But don't worry. This once life-threatening problem can now be prevented with a simple injection of something called Rogam, which prevents your body from developing antibodies to the RH factor in your baby's blood. <laughs> So you may feel a little soreness around the site, but that's normal. It's just from, from the shot itself. I don't worry about that. Another hurdle. Yes, another hurdle. But that 28-week checkup isn't over yet. Your doctor has some more work to do, and so do you. It's routine at about 26 to 28 weeks that you have what's called a glucose screen. And that is a, a test that is um, trying to identify patients who are at higher risk for having something called gestational diabetes. It's a special kind of diabetes that only occurs, occurs during pregnancy and it goes away after the pregnancy is over. And it's important because gestational diabetes can affect the growth of the fetus and the ma maturation of the other fetal organs. The glucose screen consists of taking a, a, it's usually an orange soda or a cola soda that contains 50 grams of glucose, which is a, a pretty good, good chunk of, of glucose. It's getting, it's making me lightheaded. Adverse reactions. Some patients may experience one or more of the following problems. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or fainting. Oh, great. <laughs> Once you finish downing that high octane sugar shake, you'll have to wait an hour for it to really kick in. Then you'll have your blood drawn for analysis. I know, I know, you're starting to feel like a pin cushion. But remember, it's all for a good cause. So in an hour, it'll be uh, 25 of 11. All right, good. Fortunately for Renee, her gestational diabetes test comes back normal. But Judy is not so lucky. Like two to 5% of all pregnant women in the United States, she has gestational diabetes. For first-time parents Judy and Jeff, the idea of having any problem is pretty scary. But as problems go, this one is relatively easy to treat. There's plenty that can be done to ensure your and your baby's health. The overwhelming majority of cases of gestational diabetes can be treated just by controlling your diet. You just watch what you eat and watch the, the amounts of sugars that you take in. Okay, let me just measure your belly. Too much sugar in your system can cause your baby to grow too large. In a baby that's really large, there's an increased risk for the mother to have a cesarean section because they can't deliver a baby that big. Um, an increased risk that possibly when the baby's delivered vaginally, a shoulder can get stuck because the baby's shoulders are big also. There are many ways to monitor gestational diabetes. The baby's size can be watched with ultrasound and blood sugar can be measured with an insulin kit that should be covered by your health insurance. In Judy's case, diet alone did not control her blood sugar levels, so she has started taking insulin pills. If you can't control your, your blood sugars or your diabetes by a diet, don't feel guilty because a lot of women can't. It doesn't have to do with the fact that you're eating too much or eating the wrong things. It has to do with the, the fact that the placenta is producing hormones that your body really can't deal with the sugars as effectively as women who don't have gestational diabetes. The good news is that gestational diabetes won't prevent Jeff and Judy from having a healthy baby. Like most medical problems that come up at this time, it is treatable. So remember, if you experience anything, anything that seems strange or unusual, call your doctor.
and the level, you know, if it's a... But in the second trimester, if you have bleeding, then you really should call your doctor because your doctor needs to evaluate the possibility of preterm labor or a placenta that's implanted over the cervix, known as placenta previa, or some other abnormality that might be happening. If you're feeling really a lot of pressure, um, something different than what you've been feeling all along, or pressure associated with cramping, or pressure with a lot of mucus discharge, that would be a reason to call your doctor. If you feel like you're contracting and they're starting to get regular, then you should look at your watch and you should start counting them. And if you have more than six contractions in an hour, then you really should let your doctor know. Once you pass around 23, 24 weeks and you don't feel movement that you've really been feeling consistently before, that's a reason to call your doctor and just make sure that things are okay. You have a fever that's persistently high, and I say more than 102 for a day or so, then you should call your doctor. If you feel really severe, severe pain and it's not going away, that's a reason to call your doctor. Now that we've seen what happens at your 28-week checkup and the many ways your doctor can help with problems that come up as your second trimester winds down, it's time to move on to something that's on every pregnant woman's mind. Labor. I'm starting to get labor paranoid. Pregnancy for Dummies will return to relieve those fears and phobias surrounding delivery. Renee, a first-time mom, is starting to get a bit nervous about labor. I'm starting to get labor paranoid. <laughs> What's labor paranoid? And I am deathly afraid of like an episiotomy, a cesarean, and all this stuff. And I guess what I'm wondering is, is do you do do you do episiotomies when they're only absolutely necessary? Yes. Okay. And you don't know that really until just when the right, baby's yeah. head is coming out and you're, and you're looking and you see the skin stretching and you say, you know, if it looks like you're just going to tear, then sometimes we'll just make a little cut so you don't have a big tear. Yeah. Um, but otherwise we try to let you do it on your own. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the section, you know, the average in this country, about 20 to 22 percent of women will have a cesarean section. and that's. Pretty much what it is in Mount Sinai for people having their first baby, maybe a little bit, a little bit lower, maybe. What else? What else is worrying you? I think that that was like my biggest worry was just the. I read this book. I should never have read this book. It was just very much promoting the natural way, like no drugs, no nothing. So I think that it was really making putting like the fear in you of like. Oh, this episiotomy can be horrible. You know, like the drugs, they slow down the labor, they could affect the baby. And I was like, <gasps> you know, this oh is why, God. I mean, it's important. This is why I say it's really, it's not good to be at the extreme of things, yeah. you know? And, um, I mean, there are some people where that may work for and they're very into it, but that doesn't mean that that's yeah. going to be your philosophy about it. I have any While Renee will have to wait another 12 weeks to see what really happens during labor. Her doctor can alleviate a lot of her fears, and so can her mom. Oh, I, I guess the thing I want you to know is that, you know, yeah, you will have pain, but boy, is it worth it. It is the most amazing thing in the world. Oh, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> when they put that baby in your arms, when they put you on my tummy, it was worth so, anything you had to go through. And you know what? It's not that bad. So remind me of that when I'm in labor. And you, you know what? Remind me of that. I, I will in labor. remind you, and you will not be afraid. And just don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. You have everyone around you who is there to make this easier for you. Yeah. And there's really nothing to be afraid of. The end results are you have this wonderful little person that'll be with you the rest of your life, and that you that'll love you like nobody could love you, and that you will love like you've never loved before. Wendy finally got it all together. She understands what's happening to her body and her baby. Coming up next, labor. Ay, ay, ay. Now, now. Our journey through the second trimester has come to an end. We've seen how your baby grows, soared through prenatal testing, and went shopping. Next time on Pregnancy for Dummies, our focus will be on the third trimester 
and the big build-up to labor. Preparing for it, experiencing it, and delivering your very own bundle of joy. Be there for the births of babies, babies, and more babies. And don't miss the answer to your most burning question. Is it time yet? Oh, oh! Honey, I think we're having a baby. Hurry!